Well, I've swum the English Channel. Most open water swimmers, if they've done the channel, they then look for something that they can do that will be unique. It's almost like uh, charting new territory. You want to do something that no one else has done. About a thousand people have swum the English Channel since 1875. Nine people, I think, have swum between Scotland and Northern Ireland, but no one has swum between Scotland and the Orkney Isles, and I want to be the first to, uh, to be a trailblazer for other, other swimmers. Right, so the shortest distance from the Orkney Isles to Scotland, the mainland, is from here, from Borough Ness to Duncan's Bay Head. That's six and a half miles. I mean, ideally, it'd be great to swim into uh, John O'Groats, but he, the pilots, I think, at this stage, feel that I might be carried by the current down here, and then I'd have to try to swim in to Scotland. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you land, as long as you, you, you land somehow. I said to him, what we've got to do is, if you want to swim the Pentland Firth, we've got to go up there and we've got to be prepared to stay for as long as it takes to do it. I met Frank 11 years ago. We were both freelance journalists at that time, and I was active in the NUJ, the Journalists' Union, and I was chair of the freelance branch, and he came to one of our meetings. Well, you know how when you meet somebody, there are the stages of you find out things, and I think you're very influenced by them when you fall in love with somebody. We were driving somewhere, and we got talking about cold water swimming, and we found out that both of us had this love of jumping into cold water in the middle of winter. And that was just amazing, because that was something I've always done. I always loved seeing Frank swimming. It was like he's most himself somehow in the water. Time. I've, I've crossed the first about 20,000 times, but I, I would never say I know it completely. And every crossing, I learned something new. I do have the uttermost respect for the Pentland Firth, and I think anybody that doesn't is a fool. But you'd be amazed at how many people have gone through the Pentland Firth on small boats and survived, not knowing that it was just there to get them. Tides in Britain, definitely. Maybe, maybe the strongest in the world, or one of the strongest, anyway. It's a funny bit of water. It's 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 not like going uh, open sea conditions or going where there's no tide. But if it's a bit rough in one place, and ten minutes later it'll it'll be different and be okay, like you know. Making the decision whether it's whether to go or not is usually the biggest problem. Is if you decide you're not going and the weather gets better, you feel like a fool. And if you decide to go and you can't get in here, for instance, that's even worse. People on board and you've got to take them back again. That's even worse. 
when I first heard about it, I was quite astonished to think that anybody would contemplate swimming the first, because I know how difficult it is to, to cross on a boat. I think I was 48 and I thought, I want to do something before I'm 50. I really, I really wanted to get back to training and swimming in the open water. And it gave me such a sense of being alive again. The English Channel is a unique swim. You know, people from all over the world come to do that swim. And for me, age 50, it's the, it's the, the greatest physical thing that I've ever done. And it took me 16 hours, 48 minutes and 20 seconds. And the 20 seconds were the best 20 seconds <laughs> of my life. It was great, crawling up in that, that beach is absolutely magical. They, they dropped off Roz, they took her ahead of me and uh, she swam in with a, a waterproof camera down her costume. So it was great. Uh, you know, when I got up onto the beach, she was there. And uh, there's a photograph of, of Roz and me and I've got my goggles up like this on my head. And, you know, people say, oh, you look so happy. I was so exhausted, the tears were running, you know, down my face. I was absolutely sobbing with exhaustion and um, you know you feel you couldn't go you couldn't go another hundred meters and of course you probably could but at that moment I felt that was it I couldn't I couldn't have crawled another hundred meters but I was uh, I'd made it you know I remember when it really started we were sitting in, the, in this sort of grey Orkney day and looking out over the, the hills of Westray and the Bay of Pirawal and then we were looking out at Papa Westray and Frank mentioned that he'd quite like to swim to it. And then he swam between Papa Westray and Westray. And that was really, I think, when, I think that was the night when the, uh, the germ of the idea of swimming the Pentland Firth really began. I really, really love that place. And the idea of swimming between Scotland and a place that you adore that that's the icing on the cake. That's that's magical because it's uh, it's not just a stretch of water. It's, it's swimming between two cultures and and uh, it's swimming swimming between places with a different history. I want to add to that history. Exciting, we've got here. My little heart's going like this. Poor Roz, she keeps waking up and, and she says that I'm swimming in my sleep. Um, the strange thing, I was dreaming about it last night and I couldn't, I was swimming, but I couldn't find a place to land. I don't know what that means. Everywhere I was trying to land, the, the, the waves were crashing on the rocks or, the, you know, the, 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 the water was splashing up in the cliffs. So I don't know if that means something. I was, so I'm going to hope that uh, tonight I dream about swimming smoothly into John O'Groats Harbour and walking up the road for a pint. <laughs> the conditions have to be right. And I don't know what right is for a swimmer because nobody's any experience of crossing the Pentland Firth at one and a half knots, which apparently is the speed that Frank's swims at. The only other person I heard about in that area was someone that fell off a tanker but got picked up by a, a coaster that was falling it. The Pentland Firth has been described as the worst piece of water in the world. There's not a soul that I've talked to that sailed through there that has anything good to say about the Firth. You can see the change in their face. You can see the blood drain when, when, when they reminisce. The, the currents that go by there are, well, on the chart here at nine knots, with, with uh, spring tides, nine knots, nine knots. There's one at 12 knots. 
and you can get it up half as much again in extreme conditions. It's not like an even sea, it's just comes in at all angles and nasty stuff. You can't beat experience as far as this type of work goes. I like to think of enough knowledge just to steer clear of the worst things that can happen in the Firth. And it's just a graveyard for ships. I've just been reading a book about the building of the Scottish lighthouses and there was a reference in that to the Pentland Firth being known as Hell's Mouth. particularly violent and dangerous when the tidal stream is opposed by gales in the opposite direction. And in some ways it uh, puts into words the fears that you have underneath uh, about what's happening, you know, in the water, beneath the surface. It just suggests to me at certain times a day that we just couldn't cover that stretch of water. We'll have to rely on the the wind blowing in a particular direction, as well as the tide going in a particular direction, as well as the currents being right. And if any of them are not, uh, you know, if any of these are out of sync, I think we're in deep trouble and it would be impossible. I've been across that stretch of water lots of times on a ferry, and even on the ferry you think, wow, you know, is it possible? Could anybody swim this? I'm going to have a go. I mean, I've really, really, I'm determined to do it. I've got to do it before I'm too old. Never mind under the... No, no I, I think... Don't you need to get right up? This is St Mary's and that's the pier, so we're on the end of that pier. Yeah. And I'm just trying to see if I can see where this pier that he's going to swim to is. See you in a bit then, Rod. Is he still going further out, is he? He's trying to swim across to the other pier. What? And no, no rescue boat or whatever? Maybe I'll write in this. Would it be half a mile? Probably, yeah. yeah. You can have an initial body shock where you can't breathe and, and uh, you know, you feel very uncomfortable in the water. But the long-term effect is the most dangerous, and that's hypothermia. Lots of people um, have to get pulled out because they actually don't know where they are, and it's very, very dangerous. Hypothermia can make you feel warm. It gets so bad that people begin to feel comfortable in the water, and they don't really know that they're dying. The one thing I've been able to do is withstand the cold. But the problem is that once you're over 50, your circulation starts to deteriorate. Now I'm beginning to feel it, you know, you feel it in your toes, your hands start to seize up, so you swim like a claw. So you, you begin to realise that time's running out, you know, so that's why, that's why you've got to do things while you still can. Uh, well, you managed to reach down. I don't know. You have to stand up. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Oh, God. I 
had said earlier in the day that I was going to try to do an hour, but in my own mind, I'd secretly said it'd be great if you could do an hour and a half or two, and then that will, you know, you'll feel reassured. He always says he feels much better after the first half hour or so, or after the first hour. He starts, you know, he often says, I didn't get into it for the first hour. <laughs> so he's probably just beginning to enjoy it now. How long is that? Um, three and a half hours. Three and a half? Yeah. That's good. Oh. How are you? Cold. Ah, <coughs> oh, that was freezing. Oh. Well, well done. Good. That well, that's a good, that's a good measure, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I can still talk, that's another good sign. Of course, I really admire Frank. When, when I see him in the water and when he swam the channel, it was just unbelievable. There he was for 60 and three quarter hours. He never, he never let up, he never slowed down. He, he never for a second lost his focus. He was just swimming with everything in him, absolutely determined to do it. And that's incredibly impressive. I really admire that and knowing that if if it was at all possible, he was going to do it. It's not like the, the, the English Channel where the water goes one way for so many hours and another way for so many hours. You can account for that. So even if you get carried sideways for a few hours and the tide turns, you get carried back. So you're going to end up where you want to go. Penton First is not like that. There are so many tidal streams and eddies. You know, initially I said I was astonished to think that anybody would try it. And in fact, I was actually quite concerned when Mungo spoke to me about someone swimming the first, I thought, you know, it's, it's quite dangerous. Depends if you can time it right, and it depends who, who strong the air comes in. You see, it'll, you'll go down that way, and then it'll start to carry you maybe a bit more that way, and when you get further down, it'll be starting to carry that way, because by the time you get across the air, it'll be able now. Mm -hmm. It will be. And unless you're going to run across on the surface. Really? Yeah. Because it's, it doesn't stay slack. And it's a long way. We don't know how much help you're going to get for the tide. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Or how much hindrance you're going to get at the other side. Mm -hmm. okay. If he goes out north of the loader, like out, out off the back of the creel or somewhere, yeah. he won't make it out by there. No. The tide will pull you down on top of the loader, but you mm -hmm. can't swim fast enough to get out by there. Mm -hmm. No way. You mm -hmm. couldn't even row across there to get yeah. to clear the loader. And I came out of there one day. Swanna, past Swanna. Yeah, heading, heading this way. Mm -hmm. And I was doing 15.8 knots that way. Gee whiz. Yeah, there's a lot of tide there. Yes. It took Mungo months, I think, to work out how he might approach the swim. To be fair to both uh, Mungo and Gordon, they, they were enthusiastic, but they didn't minimise the dangers. All the barriers that we might face were indeed placed in front of us. And I think that, that first meeting really brought it home to us why no one had done this before. By the time you get down there, it, the tide will be carrying you down, but once you get further down, you, you, you'll find it at, it, it's turning, you see, and it's swinging round, and it, it'll, it'll start to push you back that way. Which is ideal in a way, because it'll be taking you back towards the land, but you don't want to be too far up that way when the aim comes in, you want to be down there. Yeah. So tide's going to be your problem. How far you're going to be carried, yeah. of course. Who called this? What's the sea temp at the end of the channel? Well, you'll laugh. It's 16 or 17, you know. It's a lot, it's a lot warmer. But I know, I know that. That's know almost that. about twice what it is here. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I drink my coffee here. Yeah. <laughs> uh. people, when people get hypothermia, usually they swim in circles or they, they go backwards and they don't know where they are. And what we'll do is we'll work out some questions in advance that Rose can ask me like my telephone number or, you know, how many children I have or what my wife's name is, all these yeah. sorts of things. And if I get it wrong, she'll leave, she'll, you. She'll, leave <laughs> <laughs> she'll leave me in the water, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I get the name wrong, you had it. <laughs> okay, I'll, um, well, I'll speak to you about half past two and we'll, we'll just uh, see how, how, the, um, how it's flowing then. 
ओके I thought I was ready to do the swim. I'd prepared myself to cope with the temperatures. You know, there was a phone call every night and uh, Gordon Wiley said, sorry, it's canceled tomorrow. The weather forecast means that it's not on or the winds are going to be too high um, or I'm not prepared to take you out, it's too dangerous. So that was very frustrating uh, for that first tide. Uh -huh. Okay, well, look, that, that's, thank you for that. That's, that's um, you know, that's sort of drawn on your experience. That's, we need to know that. Well, shall I phone you tomorrow? Oh yeah. No, I mean for Wednesday. I mean for Wednesday. Phone you about this time for Wednesday. He's just he's down at Burrick. What looking out? Mm. He says it's absolutely hellish. All the preparation was really for that first neap tide, uh, and unfortunately the weather made just meant that every single day the swim was ruled out. Hello, it's Frank here. How are you? I'm just phoning, phoning to see um, whether you think there's any chance that we could go tomorrow, or um, you know what, what your what your uh, your views on that are. He said there might be a chance on Thursday. The tide will be stronger, which is a problem, but the weather looks better. But he said there'll be four or five days next on the next tide in two mm. weeks. You know, bloody hell. The longer you have to wait, the more frustrating it can be. And if you're coming to the end of a tide and there's one day left and they say, well, shall we go or shall we not? You'd obviously want to take the risk you know, even though the, the conditions might not be suitable. I think it was very uh, difficult for him to deal with. He was still not sure whether he would ever get the chance to try. As Gordon Wiley said, you know, there'll be at least one day in the year that you might be able to swim. But the problem is we can't wait for 364 days to find out when that will be. Waiting for the swim is one of the, uh, the greatest occupational hazards of a swimmer. It's almost like the tides or the, the weather throws it back in your face and says, how dare you think you can take us on? You have to be psychologically able to wait and wait and wait and wait just for that chance. Some people, um, seemingly some of the fishermen have been talking on the radio about uh, this crazy idea of swimming the Pentland Firth. You know, had anybody ever heard of anything so ridiculous? And you others, the ferry uh, pilots and uh, 
people who have bigger creel boats, they think that it's, uh, it is eminently possible and uh, you just have to get the tides right. But that doesn't explain why nobody's done it before. If it was possible, I'm sure it would have, uh, would have been attempted more frequently. This is at the slack water, this is the slackest it'll be. And you, you still see that turbulence going out there. We've had to delay for nearly two weeks until there's another neap tide coming up and we hope that we'll be able to make the attempt then. And in between we've been, I've been doing lots of practice swims and uh, trying out the water, going out with the, the boat, um, trying to swim in different conditions. And now we're narrowing down the, the place that we may uh, be able to set off from. Yeah, look how it's pulling that it's boy. I wanted to see if the water would rush down past uh, this headland because if it did rush down then you would know that it would be unsafe to swim out from here or even to attempt to be dropped here. But what I'm going to do is talk to Mungo now and see if we can do a trial, a trial swim from here maybe tomorrow evening. Storms have hit the northeast of England, there's been flooding, there's been torrential rain, city centres have been under two feet of water. And um, I'm just worried now that tomorrow, being Monday, the, it's all going to catch up here and um, it's going to be difficult to, to get out. A whole year of, of training and not to have the chance, I mean, that would be, be absolute torture. If we don't do it this time, we'll have to wait another fortnight. It'll be, the, the temperature will maybe start dropping and the darkness will be coming in. I've really got to do it now, or it's um, it's got my name and address. back to the drawing board. Mungo's name and address. And it says, 7 September 2008, Declaration of Indemnity. This is to certify that any swims undertaken by Frank Chalmers in the waters of Scapa Flow or the Pentland Firth, with the assistance of Mungo Montgomery, including practice swims and attempts to cross the Pentland Firth, are being undertaken by Frank Chalmers at his own risk and that neither Mungo Montgomery nor any others on board will be liable for any injury caused to Frank or to his death should this result from any of his swims. Ros Bailey also declares that should any injury to Frank arise or should he die as a result of any of the swims she will not hold Mungo Montgomery or anyone else on board during any, any of the swims responsible for this should this occur. Mungo phoned me and said, Frank would like you to be on the boat and what we want to do is have a trial run and see if we can clear the tide that would potentially carry him down past the loader, which means you'd have to abort the swim because you would never get anywhere against the tide. So we just set off in the afternoon and went down to the Barth Head and Frank went ashore. When he starts to swim, if he's starting from the boat, he's got to be able to first swim ashore, and then he's got to be able to swim out from the shore. The idea was that on the Monday, he would see if he could swim out fast enough to not get carried onto the rocks. It was just the most fantastic day. I mean, the, the sea was just glassy and the sun was warm. So as we were sailing down, we were both just feeling desperate that he wasn't going to be able to swim on this day. We both felt exactly the same about it. But as far as we knew, there was no chance of it happening. 
you know, so we were just there. We were just afternoon trippers out in the boat for a half hour swim. I could see that he was just going all out for it. I knew that what he was going to try and do was to swim so fast and so well and so strongly that somehow Mungo would agree to let him have a go. It was all working absolutely perfectly, just as you know we'd hoped it would. And he swam on and he swam on and he swam on and he swam on and then there just came this wonderful moment when Mungo said that, yes, you know, okay, we'll, you know, let him have a go. But he said, don't tell Frank yet. It was so exciting. It was just wonderful. Well, we're past the lugger. We're going all the way. <coughs> See you in Scotland. <laughs> I'll need a cup of tea or something then. On the hour. On the hour, right. <coughs> Thank you, Mungo. <coughs> See you in Scotland, I think I said. There's nothing nicer than being part of helping somebody to achieve what they really want in life. We didn't have the Vaseline he needs to put on. We didn't have his energy drink. We had all this food in the caravan that we were going to have on the big swim. I just felt so proud of him and so full of love for him, just knowing that, you know, even if he was really cold and really hungry and, you know, he didn't have the right things, that wouldn't affect him in the slightest. He would just swim. I come from Dundee and uh, the school I went to had a swimming pool. The swimming pool uh, manager was also the secretary of an open water swimming club. So once a year, the kids at the school, if you, if you were a good swimmer, you were uh, allowed to train up to swim the River Tay. Suddenly you felt you could do anything. Uh, to be able to swim across a freezing cold river for a mile when you're 12 or 13, you feel that, you, you know, nothing's impossible. The great thing about open water swimming is that it's you against elements. So you feel you're, you're pitting yourself against the cold and the waves and the wind and the currents and the tides. And it's, it's a real challenge. You're actually out in the open under the sun or the rain. And it's also exhilarating. So when you come out, you feel refreshed and full of life. I really think there's something magical about the open water. You have to be able to ad adapt your stroke. You have to read the water. It's, it's fantastic. You have to be at one with the water. Well, the tide's stronger than the man, but hopefully the tide will slacken off in about half an hour to three quarters an hour. It's pushing southeast at the moment.
on some of the bigger swims, you know, you, you actually you can swim along and you see fish underneath you, you see right down deep to the to the seabed. Uh, you, you have to swim and untangle yourself from seaweed. You're swimming alongside a boat, a safety boat. So there's that umbilical cord between you and the outside world. You, you're, you're communicating quietly with whoever's in your boat. They're just keeping an eye on you all the time uh, to make sure you're safe. And here, yeah. Well, maybe longer if you have. Got another bit? It's a very, very pure relationship that Ros and I have when she's on the boat because although a lot of things go unspoken, it's really reassuring to know that somebody is there just looking out for you all the time. swimming along I saw this flash a couple of times underneath me and this was in quite deep water I thought oh, oh. Uh, what do orcas look like what do killer whales look like but then I saw these two beady eyes looking up at me and this this um, seal on its back just swimming effortlessly underneath about six feet away looking up mirroring me I always feel that Frank's like a seal in the water. And then seeing them swimming alongside him, they look so they do look so like him, with their round heads and their, their sleek bodies and just coming to look and just being in touch with wild creatures like that's amazing. In the channel or in any open water swims, these rules are the same for everyone. You're allowed to wear a normal swimming cap, normal trunks or costume and uh, normal goggles, so wetsuits aren't allowed and it means that it's you against the cold water. You can't buy your way to success, this is another great thing. You can't buy the latest gear to give you an advantage. You're not attached to the boat, in fact if you, if you touch the boat or hold on to the safety boat, you're disqualified. It's basically you against the, the elements, the way it has been for over 125 years. You have to get into what they call a zone. You have to you have to detach yourself because the cold and the, the pain in your muscles and the, the you know the, the isolation is so strange. You've you've actually got to detach yourself and be somewhere else. So you you forget about everything else that's going on around you. Uh, you just focus on your swimming and you know this the stop the time between feeds it may take half an hour between each each feed and it goes like five minutes and sometimes you do things like you count or you sing songs uh, to yourself in, in your head and um, you know I go over lots of different verses and uh, and I sing one or two that I've written myself about swimming the problem is if you forget the words to your own songs, that's a, that's a good indication that the cold is getting to you. There's a tale that's passed down in myth and legend Of a place that no one sees and lives to tell Some say it's the entrance to Eden And others the gateway to hell uh, They say that the women are like mermaids And the men are like gods down from on high They just never be tempted by the welcome Don't 
looking round and um, sometimes I didn't really see all of the boat you know you'd, if you're in at the top of a swell or at the, at the bottom of a swell the boat had disappeared and you could see the masts or other times I'd look round and I could see the deck of the boat because it was tipping over you know maybe 30 degrees angle onto its side and that really felt like we were in a different sort of sea that before we'd been in a sea, but now it felt like we were really in the ocean. Frank was fine, he was swimming along, and you know, the, the plan was still working, and we could see Duncan's behead the whole time. What we were waiting for was for the tide to turn, because the whole plan had been that he would swim down, the tide would take him out to the east, and then the tide would turn and bring him back to the west. So we were waiting and I kept asking, well, I asked a few times Mungo whether the tide had turned and how soon it would turn. And then he said, it's late. It's later than we expected. And then, uh, you know, it, it hasn't started to, to come. And meanwhile, we're going around in a sort of semicircle. And we've come south of the beginning of Scotland, but we weren't getting any closer to it. And then the worst of it was that the sun was coming down. And so, we're moving around in an arc and the sun's coming down and it was obvious that there was less and less chance that he'd be able to do it. How are you doing? Well, I don't think we're getting any nearer here. The tide's soon going to help. Uh -huh. You just have to swim a bit and then the tide will turn. Good. That'll make it easier. Do you want some Mars bar? Or banana? <coughs> no, thank you. Biscuit? What? Biscuit? No, no. Oh. And as the sun was getting low, I could tell how quickly it would start to get difficult to see him. You know, I began to realise that it wasn't going to happen. I think I could see that Frank had, had come to that conclusion. I saw him looking round. It was almost like he was expecting me to tell him to come in. And Mungo said, well, he and Willie had just been talking and they decided that they'd come to that conclusion. So then I just, I just had to signal him. And at that point I just felt, I felt, you know, I was, oh, you know, I just felt so sad. And I just felt, it just was, yes, so sad from the, that sort of high moment of, of certainty earlier in the day and then to have to bring him in.
body counterparts, Chris Hoy and all. And congratulations to them. That's all the sport for me tonight. But this guy mm. coming up also deserves a gold medal too. Thanks. Not if I get a compliment from you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think she means <laughs> the swimmer from Dundee. He's the first to have crossed the treacherous waters of the Pentland Firth. Frank Chalmers set off from South Ronaldsey on the Orkney yesterday afternoon. After almost four hours and eight miles, he'd reached Duncan's Bay Head on the Scottish mainland. But unfortunately for Frank, it looks like his efforts won't be officially recognised. Why not? Colin White reports. Orkney yesterday afternoon, and Frank Chalmers is preparing. It's the first time I've failed in any swim in my life. I've never ever had to come out on the English Channel, the Gulf of Corry Brecon, the Hellas Pont, Inner Hebrides. You know, I've never not been successful, so it's a new experience for me. But it just shows you what the tides are like. And the great thing is, you know, the pilots, as far as they're concerned, I've made that crossing. I mean, I don't regard it as, as a crossing because I, I didn't land at the other side. But what I do think is that it opens the way up for other swimmers. Anybody who's younger and faster than me should be prepared to come and pick up that challenge. I often wake up in the middle of the night thinking I wonder if it's possible to swim across the River Tay on New Year's Day. There's a book by Virginia Woolf called To the Lighthouse, and it made me think, oh, there must be hundreds of lighthouses around Britain. People could swim to the lighthouses. That's what keeps me awake at night. be honest, if Mongo Montgomery and Willie Bremner phoned me up next year and said, we've been thinking, Frank, if we just start at a slightly different place and at a different time, then there's a chance that you can land uh, on Scotland. Uh, you know, you can swim from one part of Orkney and land on the, the Scottish mainland. How could I say no? I'd have to go and try again. Once round the Lido, just try the water. It's only swimming, that's what they're singing. Don't try the Lido, avoid the water, or you'll be swimming around in circles all your life. <laughs>